yeah, yeah. So you're you're in the Atlanta area, right? Atlanta. I live in I live in Atlanta. Yep. How's the weather out there? Actually, it's raging rainy right now, but we actually get like really traditional four seasons. Yeah, oh, uh, yeah, which, yeah, which I love. Yeah, um, I lived out so, there. For, I lived out there for twenty twenty one years. Okay, so you, yeah. so you know that. Oh yeah, yeah I know it. I'm, I'm very familiar with it. Very. Familiar this with is the real Wakanda, as you know it. Then. <laughs> Yes, that's, you're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah, this is. I tell people all the time. I'm Puerto Rican. You know what I'm saying? So, uh-huh. I, you know, to come to live in Atlanta, I've been here for 18 years now. After 9/11, I came here. Okay. And to see actual, not just new, but truly old school uh-huh. black business owners. Uh huh. Yes. You don't see that a lot in other cities. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's not as consistent. As the longevity really right. isn't there either. In other cities, mm-hmm. but for if Atlanta is like, it's it's permanent. It's yeah, it's, it's permanent. <laughs> it's 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 here. Like it's not going anywhere, and especially because the surrounding area. Like I I, I could I, I say Atlanta is the, um, uh, New York of the South. Right. Okay. Yeah. Good description. Because the surrounding states is nothing else. Sorry, sorry Alabama. Sorry, Mississippi, Tennessee, South Carolina, and a, and a portion of Florida we connected to. It's already country, and when you get to those other states. And Atlanta is the only major city. And the other weird part is that it's the, it's the only other major city is not connected with a borderline to another state. So it's really kind of secluded on its own, like Wakanda is. <laughs> so, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, so it's I can't. For, I love it. It's badass. The culture is here. We've become the number one movie and TV industry now. Yeah. Um, we surpass LA. Um, music wow. has always okay. been yeah. We surpass LA now. So. Um, and music has always been a, a constant here. That's one thing has. And now fashion was that you know, every city, every, every major city has a, has a trifecta. They have music, okay. they have film industry, and they have fashion. Mm-hmm. Atlanta was missing the fashion. They was very unique in their ways, but they didn't have a solid found, found, a foundation in fashion. And now Buckhead has become that fashion, okay. that okay. Rodeo Drive, that Fifth right. Avenue of New York. Yeah. Um, so now that's coming in. And I think uh, the next 20, 30 years, watch out for Atlanta. Like, wow. It's it's gonna be insane. Yeah, that's how that's how I ended up moving to Atlanta. I was in um, I was in the Navy here in San Diego, where I am now, and I heard about this Mecca, you know, hot hot landed. This was ninety three, ninety three, ninety four. Oh, yeah. And I heard about this man. Yeah, what? I caught the end. I think I got one season of it, and then after that, it fizzled out. But uh, oh, it was wild. <laughs> it was wild. Uh, but yeah, it, it was the you know it was the Mecca. Everyone, you know, the melting pot. Everyone moving to Atlanta. So I went out there. You know, was I was at that time I was in IT. I was just starting my IT career, and man, I, you know, I, I think my first job out there was like thirty six thousand dollars, coming from an eighteen thousand salary to a thirty six thousand salary. Made it, uh, <laughs> made it, man. And so, yeah, as you say, it's 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 stable. The you know the the black uh, the black community and business. I remember when I first uh, lived out there. I went to a black family house out in Decatur near Flash Hills Parkway. And I walked into their house. I'm like, whoa, black people live like this out here. Nice. And so it's been, it's, it's been like, it's been stable for the, you know, as long as I've been there and probably, you know, another 30, especially with Tyler Perry and all these other studios moving out there. Uh, plus the businesses uh, that's out in Alpharetta and Cobb County area. Yes. Uh, actually, I live in near Alpharetta. I live in the Sandy Springs area. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. On the north side of town. And um, yeah, you're right. Like, it's, it's, it's funny how I'm not sure. <clears throat> Uh, you know, but gentrification, how you feel about it. Mm-hmm. But uh, for me, you know, growing up in bed in Brooklyn, I grew up a block away from Marcy Projects where Jay-Z was at and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. That's in Talkers Projects. And uh, now it's being gentrified, that whole area. And people are upset about it. And for me, and let me know if I'm wrong, because this is kind of your area as far as achievement and goal setting, right? And for me, we already had gentrified the, the, the area, the location, for over 40 or 50 years, brown and black people, right? Mm-hmm. We decided to only open up either a liquor store or a bodega, or sometimes neither, because sometimes a lot of times people open up businesses in the hood and we still didn't own it. It was either Asian uh, group that may have owned it, the corner store or something like that, right, or, right. or a Hispanic person. But um, we didn't do nothing else. We, we didn't open our own bakery and coffee shops and things like that. We, we glorified being hood. We glorified being mm-hmm. ghetto. Mm-hmm. And... We did nothing with it. And then so then when we seen other people come that didn't look like us and valued the culture and what we had made out of it, 
which is graffiti and whatever we got out of it, and they're glorifying it. And they say, hey, I'm going to offer, I'm going to open up a coffee shop. I don't care who's here. And then their friends and their cousins come open up a bakery and another spot and another spot after that. And then they take over. Now we're mad. Right. Yeah, I'm kind of. I'm not. I'm not. I won't say I'm for it or against it. I've seen what it how it can benefit the inner city, but I've also seen how it could impact the uh, the suburbs because living in Snellville, which is Gwinnett County's uh, Stone yeah. Mountain side of the city, you know, when they did gentrification downtown around the Olympics and they start pushing oh, yeah. all these people out and. Uh, so the folks in uh, off of Deshaun and Harrison, they started getting pushed out to where we were, which is what you know, uh, Highway 78, Snellville, Grace, and Loganville. And with that, you know, we saw a decline in our school district. Uh, the shallow school district went down, right. and so you know, it's you can't just push the people out without giving them a mindset change to go with that. Correct. And, and so if you don't have both of those, then you're going to just they're going to just take what they know and do it elsewhere. And so I think that's where the gentrification process is missing is all. I think it's more about inner city development, urban development, money. But they're not giving the people that mindset that, hey, we're going to give you a fresh start in a better place. But let me teach you how to live you know, successfully in this new area. That's what's missing. So let me ask you this then. Is, is that – is that government? Is that the local community? Is that us going back to our community and offering those those pieces? I think it's all three. I think it's first – first, I think it first start with the government. I'll tell you why. Because it's the government or the the uh, yeah the lobbyists, the government coming in and giving these people you know good money for their home just so they can get out and make more money for their property. And so if you're going to do that without educating them, financial literacy. Uh, you know, uh, career development, stuff like that, then you're the first, my, in my opinion, you're the first line in, in hurting the downline, hurting the community that you're pushing these people into. So I think it's all three. I think it's all three that have to be uh, come together, collaborate, and, and be a part of the literacy in different areas that needs to happen when you hit, when you go through this gentrification process. I, I agree with that because the simple fact that I know when I was growing up in the 90s, you know, I was a teenager, and you never heard you never heard the word entrepreneur in the hood. Mm-hmm. No, you, heard no. of hus- you heard of hustler, you heard of drug dealer, grinder, you know what I'm saying? But you never heard the word entrepreneur. Now the word is kind of being diluted. Everyone be, is an entrepreneur, so, right? Um, whether they actually have a business or not, they call themselves an entrepreneur. Um, how do we how do we get from going into the hood? Having I know back in the day it wasn't just bad people, just all of a sudden just decided to be bad people things had to have happened um to the neighborhood to get that way and i know growing up in the projects it's called a project for a reason because it literally was a project mm-hmm. right it was an experiment um i grew up in an area where i was surrounded my my, my building was made out of bricks was made out of concrete and steel it was 20 stories high wow. uh, I, I lived in the 11th floor and my apartment would, had a steel door I had metal framed windows with metal guards in the window and concrete walls. What does that sound like to you? And the courtyard was in the middle of the project. Mm -hmm. So so you didn't get to see the street. You saw this courtyard. So Mm -hmm. it sounds like D-block. It sounds like jail. Right, right, exactly. Right. So when you have that mindset already and you find people surviving compared to living, and then you see this other group come in, I think – ethnic group or, or race come in and they take over yeah it, it is disheartening mm-hmm. but then at the same time too is like we were always to be a project we were never always ever to give in the leg up whether it was business loans or anything else but back in the day black and brown people did have their own shit but the government just made it harder we fell out somewhere after civil rights i think we kind of fell somewhere in a loophole where we kind of just got numb or comfortable with the idea that where's the fight where we need to fight anymore? Does that makes sense to you, or we're just talking yeah. shit. No, it, no, it does. I'm, I'm following you, and I think it has a lot to do with, uh, you know, it's not, there's no one individual, one entity involved. It's a combination of, you know, the individual's responsibility for want to make a change, as right. well as the government and their propaganda, um, and their government assistance that is given, you know, the people what they think they need to to live comfortable and that's keeping them in that mindset right and, and so it, it's coming from both angles and i think the only way to 
to overcome that and really kind of stir things up and disturb that is to take someone out of their you know environment or give them some kind of uh, fight that they have to not say just survive, but you know prosper and live. And so it's, it's I think it's going to be a uh, I think it's going to go on for the rest of our lives. I don't think we'll see this. I'm 47 years old. I don't think we'll see a, a, a market different change, markedly different change in our society when it comes down to how we work with people in who's living in the projects, D blocks. Because I, I, I don't think we're there as a people. And be, actually, uh, if you look at the top, I mean, that's going to come top down. It's not going to it's not going to happen until city officials and uh, you know representative say, hey, this is what we need to infiltrate our people. But it, it's not going to benefit their cause, which is really a pocket at the end of the day. It's, it's I just think it's going to be like that forever. Um, right. Which is why I don't go into the politics. I don't go to, you know, I'm not a, a community activist per se. I'm a people activist. And so that's right. my approach to help, hopefully help the change. So when you do help someone, mm -hmm. right, what angle do you come at them? And I you know, what, what are you looking for to know that that person, one, values themselves and is, and is going to value your time and effort as well? Well, I will say a fair amount of people don't value themselves. Um, so I can't look at that first. I okay. have to look at what are their their desires and their ambition. Do they really want to change their situation? And so if I can see that enough, then I can work on their self-valuation, their self-worth for themselves. But the first thing I'm looking at, okay, how bad do you want to change? Because there are a lot of people who comes to coaches, they're they're dealing with some limiting beliefs, limiting blocks, some trauma, whatever it is. And so their 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 valuation of themselves is not really high. Uh, if not, they would really be they wouldn't be talking to certain type of coaches. I'm not talking about a business coach, I'm talking about like a life coach, personal development coach. Um, so I see that a lot. So what I'm looking for is where is your ambition? Are you, you know, do you have something that you want? To, you don't have to have necessarily an end point or an end destination, but you're ambitious enough to say, you know, I want to change my life. I don't quite know how yet. I don't quite know what that is, but Cornelius, can you help me change my life? And that's a good starting point for helping someone achieve, succeed, and thrive. Do you find that people are more dreamers than executors? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I was, I was one of those. <laughs> I was one of those. <laughs> so was and, I. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, and, and and I think it's it's large. And I'll speak from my own experience. It's largely in part because of the not not having the know how to execute. I don't know how to get started, and that's the problem. It's like, yeah, I dream about this, and and one quote would say, you know, a dream is only a wish without goals. And so when you don't have that association with, you know. Uh, okay, I need to attach goals to my dreams, then they stay at dreams. And so, they, again, a lot of people, the problem is I was there. I didn't know how to get started. When somebody showed me how to get started or listened to like a Jim Rohn, right. uh, you know, Les Brown and some of those other guys, Zig Ziglar, that's how you get started. And so if if we can help people just get started, obviously with some other things to go there, but just kind of get started it can help them see like, wow, this can actually happen. I can actually turn my dreams into a reality. Do you feel like some people are going after entrepreneurship and that's not their golden ticket, that a career is just fine as well? Absolutely, because that's the buzz thing. Like you said earlier, you know, we're, we're throwing out this entrepreneur word like it's, you know, uh, it's the gateway to, uh, to, to uh, and I think it is for, for some people. I don't know that that percentage yet. It's the gateway to the lifestyle that we want to create. And as we well know, you're not, if you're not creating your own dreams, somebody's going to hire you to, to build their dreams. Absolutely. But not everyone is, uh, I don't think, at least, uh, it could be it's, it could be a learned behavior and learned experience, but not everyone is that type kind of person where they're going to sacrifice. They're going to make the you know make take the necessary step they need to be an entrepreneur. Some people are career focused people, and they're going to make their monies. They're going to have their pensions and their 401ks through career. And I, I, so what I do when I'm talking with individuals, you know, they want they want to have this kind of lifestyle. And I kind of look at what is this vehicle that you're going to create for yourself to uh, to live this lifestyle, to enjoy this lifestyle? 
it may not be entrepreneurship. You can be great at doing this and you can build your career around this and have the lifestyle you want. And so it's really identifying, uh, you know, what they want and then taking that and now going back to the very beginning of where we are today. Now, what is it? What is your purpose? What is your passion or what are your passions and how can we use those things as a vehicle to help you live the lifestyle you want to live? And that may not be the vehicle of entrepreneurship business owner. It could be I'm going to go build my career with with T-Mobile and I'm going to have the lifestyle that I want. No, you're absolutely right. I think I think having career opportunities are not being spoken of enough, right? Okay. Where um like I said, entrepreneurship is hanging on the spotlight. It's it's everyone's talking about it, everyone's claiming it. You know, they're just going with emotions and they're complaining about shit. Mm-hmm. And you have people who have had great long careers and they're okay with that. And it's fine. They become vice presidents, president CEOs. See I last time I checked, CEOs make pretty good fucking money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um but at the same time too, you can't help everyone. Right? They gotta have that inner fight, that inner want mm-hmm. um to go after stuff. And I know you, you're, you're, you're a veteran. Thank you for serving. Thank you. Right? Thank you. Um, and people who don't know, this is Cornelius. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we've introduced you yet. Yeah, you can so, do that in post. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But um, uh, this is, you know, you were in the military for how long? I did four years, uh, four years in the Navy, uh, straight out of high school, two weeks out of high school. I joined the military um, and, yeah, got my life started that way. And what what made you um, go to the military, especially specifically to the, the Navy? Great, great question. Give a chance to me to kind of tell my story. Um, so for me in high school, awkward, skinny kid, uh, bullied in high school, didn't fit in, couldn't fit in, wasn't with the in crowd, wasn't with the nerds. You know, just one of those. As I like to say, I just existed. Right. And, and so. It, I had a couple of choices uh, upon graduation or as I was leading up to my final year in high school was, OK, work the streets, hustle, drugs, you know, because a lot of my friends were in that and a lot of my friends were in jail now because of that wow. uh, some 30 years later. So it was either work the streets, go work at a plant, which I, which I saw my dad do all of my, you know, my childhood or join the military. So those were my options. I did not have a uh and i was not academic i was not athletic and so for me going down the college route was not even an option because i just did not have that that uh at least i didn't think i was capable i didn't have that competency at that time and so i chose the military because you know it was the thing to do and it was a way for me to get my life going get away from home you know unbeknownst to me it pushed me in a direction of achievement that I did not see myself ever going at as a 17 year old kid. And so that's one thing I tell people when I'm sharing my stories, I, Hey, you don't know, especially when I'm talking to maybe college students or youth, you know, don't look at where you are today to determine how your life is going to be tomorrow or say to your past, you know, you can move beyond or go beyond your, uh, where you think you are today, or what you think you don't have. Cause I'm, you know, I'm a living witness. I would probably graduate with a, a maybe a C minus, maybe close to a D from high school. But when I got in the military, I started being able to find my way and I got around other people who were also achieving. And that gave me that, you know, hey, if they can do it, then you can do it. And so, th- you know, th- that's how I got started. It's like, hey, I need to do something with my life. If not, I would end up working at a plant, which I didn't want to do, or I would end up, you know, work in the streets, which I didn't want to do. And so the Navy, the Navy was my, you know, the best choice for me. That's fantastic. Um, with, with that being said, you touched on education. You knew that college or university wasn't for you. I know. No. And, and do you feel as of today in this, in this climate, in this world right now, that universities have yet to come up with the times and that, Less and less people are going to universities. Absolutely, yes, yes. Yep. Right. One is too expensive. That's one. Two, the see, I didn't go to university either, and I just don't learn that that sense of just sitting in a room and having someone lecture to me. Mm-hmm. I, I I can't learn that way. Like I'm maybe an interactive person, maybe a one-on-one person, but colleges, universities don't really offer anything that's new 
or they have you there too long to a point before you even get to your uh your, your major you're like when am i going to touch my major already like you're not learning you're not doing anything like, like apprenticeships like back in the day apprenticeships were, were, were genius i think because you got to touch feel get to use your, all your five right. senses actually doing it do you feel universities have a long way to go to catch up to how the climate is as of today and how they're kind of getting a bad rap? Absolutely. I, I, I think so. And you can tell that in some of the high schools, at least here where we are in California, actually even have it in Georgia, at least Gwinnett County, where once you hit a, I think your junior year in high school, you can go to a, for lack of a better word, a trade school. Um, you'll right. still do your, your high school requirements, your general ed, but there's also – uh, some programs in Gwinnett County area in Georgia where you can go to school where you're actually working on what you want to become, you know, uh, as an adult or whatever, once you graduate from high school. So I do believe that, and I feel even here in this, the colleges that I spoke with in California, they're not, you know, it, it's, it's so traditional, traditional mindset that they're missing out on millennials who are taking this alternative route, the entrepreneur, back to the entrepreneur thing, right. because they're seeing that, hey, I can. It's so, first of all, there's so many people of various age groups and backgrounds and, and uh, diversity who are succeeding, or at least project, projecting themselves as succeeding as an entrepreneur. So that carrot is dangling. That's like mm. you know, it's like everyone wants. Wow, I want. I want to. You know, look at where we are. You got YouTube. You got social media. You got Facebook. You got Instagram. All these flashy cars, these sponsored ads. Everybody flashing their money, showing that. And so that's the. You know, that's the draw to many people, especially our younger folks. Hey, I don't want to do traditional college because I can go be an online course creator or sell on Amazon or do this and do that. And I can be a millionaire for the next five years or less than that based on all the stuff that's out there. And so I think what tra what traditional college needs to do needs to somehow enroll these these people in and give them a balance between entrepreneurship and and career or entrepreneurship and corporate and that way i think the schools can be more of a service to uh to the community as well as to themselves i think also it comes down to local businesses as well investing into the local colleges especially for small town areas right um because i know in, in southern georgia it's a big peanut industry mm -hmm. and they're investing in the local community to get them to learn about you know, if they're gonna work in this plant, there's certain machinery and mechanics they need to learn. And they're helping to re-educate the community, which is fantastic, because that's their pool of staff, right? Of empl right. employers. Mm -hmm. um, what about having alignments? And, you know, you have everyone who who are alumni having some type of alignment with corporations to say, hey, sponsor us. Let's just get some kind of co-op programs going, especially for the inner cities. They tend to be forgotten, right? Yeah. Um, what, what do you think about that? I mean, I see that going on a lot here. This college, a few colleges that I've visited out here, they have in their career development center, they have these partnerships, these co-ops with uh, some of the larger companies out here in uh, San Diego County area because you know they're they're seeing that hey. If the way I understand it from a business side of it, if we can partner with Qualcomm, which is big out here, if we can partner right. with a Qualcomm and start providing the education that Qualcomm is looking for to hire, then that makes that, that pushes our enrollments up, make us look as a better college. You know, come to our school because we are, you know, we have a, you know, five percent. Uh, um, rate of people getting jobs from these corporations because of that. So I think that's already going on now. What you hit on is what's not happening, the inner city. It's not happening in the inner city because the for whatever reason, you know, the big companies are not going into the inner cities, at least in mass, to say, hey, let's tap into the potential that's in these communities here and start training these people. I don't know why that is. I just think there's this whole stigma about going into the inner city where people don't want to take chances on, you know, those coming out of the projects or coming out of some of these, uh, these urban areas uh, that are low income, their grades are not up. And so you don't see that. So uh, yeah, that's, that's what I think the problem is not so much in the outlying suburban communities, it's in the inner city where these companies are not going in and trying to not so much reach back, but pull up 
those who are there and say, hey, who's our potential in this community? Let's start working with these people here so we can get ready, so we can have an employee base 10 years from now. Absolutely, because there's going to be some turn, right? And you want to have that staff to, to be able to compete with that turn. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're not pulling from the local community, then where's that staff coming from? You're looking outwardly then. You're yeah, looking at exactly. people to have an hour commute from the workplace. Yeah. Um, Let's talk about confidence. Sure. Oh, yes. That's my thing there, confidence. <laughs> and the reason why I want to jump in is because coming from the inner city, we project confidence by having, like, you know, like we're peacocks, right? Um, oh, yeah. In the hood, we, we, show, we, sh we show the beamers. We show the gold chains, the gold teeth. We're there, right? Mm -hmm. But are we truly, really confident? Or are we just fucking showing out? Yeah, the latter, because first of all, you know, we have to understand that confidence is an inner strength. It's a inward quality, not something external to us. Right. And so you'll find that, you know, individuals with those type of things external to them showing the bling and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, they, they're, they, they're relying on this. Is, they're relying on that to be their confidence marker or their confidence badge. But you take those things away from them, you'll see something differently. Now, if you take someone who's successful, someone who is, uh, you know, entrepreneurial mindset or accomplished a lot or whatever, and, you know, they lose it all, they're going to get it back. Why? Because they have the confidence on the inside and it's not based on what they have on the outside. And so when it comes down to helping inner city youth, uh, inner city uh, 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 youngsters kind of get their confidence we have to go through this, again, mindset shift, this paradigm shift of showing them and telling them, hey, this is that way. Your confidence does not come from your, you know, your, your gold teeth and your nice car, your rims. It comes from something inner side and basically give them a scenario. What would happen to you if you lose all this here? Sure, you might have some, well, I'm going to get back out there and hustle. You know, and that's the inner confidence in itself. But you're going to have others who is going to kind of fall by the wayside, maybe start doing more crime, something like that, and just get themselves locked up. Why? The key is, it's not because of, I don't know how to do this. I don't know. I don't have the resources. I don't have the knowledge. I don't, it's not about that. All this stuff can be, uh, can be gathered and attained through, through various resources. It's because they don't have the confidence. You can take anyone, again, who has accomplished any level of success. If that confidence came from the, if that success came from an inner confidence, they'll be able to rebuild again in a short period of time. And so that's why I think, again, talking about inner city, that we need to go into the inner city and start teaching our folks these inner qualities, these inner characteristics. That way, it can, it, it'll, it'll be a more sustainable external and living experience for them. Now that also comes into play with knowing your self worth, correct? It's, it's, I will say it all starts there. And that, that even itself is a building process because you take, you take a child who may be um, 11th grader in an inner city school, you know, may have some smarts, but being bullied may have some smarts, but, you know, can't get voted for something or can't get the part in the play that deals with that person confidence and that deals with that person's um, self-worth self-esteem even though they have the intellectual knowledge even though they might be creative but because of their self-esteem because of their self-worth the evaluation of themselves they are uh, they are unable to allow their confidence to to uh, to increase because of those things there so yes when it comes down to building people confidence obviously there's some techniques and tips that I can use. But what I'm really looking for, Johnny, when I'm talking to these folks here is how do you feel about yourself? You know, are you comfortable with being who you are? And if I can detect in conversation and how they carry themselves and what they're saying, okay, your problem is not you need this, that, the other, that you need to believe in yourself more. And when you can start believing in yourself, then your confidence start increasing. You cannot separate the two. Do you think people tend to think that they're just super unique, that it's only them that go to certain things that they tend to just close up shop and, and just close in on themselves and don't be this outwardly person that they need to be? I think that's a part of it, but I, I think in this day and age, because of you know Instagram and social media, you see everybody else kind of putting out their business on there. So surely someone knows, okay, I'm not the only person out there. I think what we're dealing with is two things. It either could be one or both. Um, pride, which may stems for stems from um, I'm not going to ask for help or don't want to ask for help, or I don't know how to get help. You see that? Now with the pride, with the pride thing, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you mm -hmm. just hit something with the pride. 
is that cultural? Um, or can I don't it know. be? I don't, I'm sure it can. I don't know if it's cultural. I think it could be just, you know, I don't want to show myself as like I don't have it together. Or I don't want to show myself like, you know, I'm having problems at home. Or I don't want to show myself like I, – I don't know if it stems from a cultural or it could just be something that's going on in the home where, you know, the mom or dad tell them, you know, telling the person to be like this, to be like this, be like this, but they can't be like this for whatever reason. And so because they're trying to project this this type of uh, image to people, but on the inside they're hurting. And so now you got this whole pride thing that's, you know, stopping from asking for help. But I, again, I'm, I'm more inclined to think, especially in that age group, is that I don't know where to go get help from. And so that's where I think the, the starting point for maybe your 16, 17, 18 year olds, I don't know where to go get help from. And because I don't know where to get help from, I can't, you know, I'm, I'm never, I'm not going to be able to build my self-esteem or my, my confidence because I don't know how, where to start to, to build that up. Do you feel baby boomers have that same issue? Because now that the job sector has changed so much, the whole idea, the whole idea of having a 30 year career somewhere and having a pension, like you said, you wanted to avoid yourself, um, is gone. Like, I think they deal with a different, and of course, I'm not in the baby boomer generation. My parents are, but I, I deal. They, I think they deal with at this in 2019. They deal with a diff, different issue, and you kind of allude to it. I've been working for the last 40, 50 years of my life, and now here's these, you know, millennials coming in, and so now what? What has happened again? This is just the way our world is, our society is. What has happened with these baby boomers and maybe even folks in my generation, because I'm 47, so I'm getting to up in age a little bit myself, <laughs> is, that, <laughs> yeah, 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 is that we have, we have built – and I'll just stick with the baby boomers. They have built their identity around their career, around working at the plant, around working at the right. factory or whatever job is. And so now when you start taking away that identity or start messing with my identity, changing my identity – I'm going to lose confidence. I've talked to people who have transitioned out of the military. They've been in the military for 22 years. They retired now. Their identity was in the military. And even though they have all of these skills and these, you know, these uh, uh, tours they have done, because their identity was in the military, or being, you know, being the Army or Navy or the Marines, they don't have the confidence now to come into civilian life and succeed as they did in the military. And so when you start dealing with people's identity or you start taking their identity away, absolutely they're going to have um, issues uh, moving forward or having that confidence. And that's what I think baby boomers are dealing with. Say, hey, I, I, this has been my life the last 35 years. All of a sudden I've got to go reinvent myself. It's not going to happen that easily. And that's going to – the longer it takes them to, you know, to reinvent themselves – or be secure in their identity, the, the, the deeper their lack of confidence and self-esteem, self-worth is going to go down, go down, go down, go down. Right. Yeah, because at that, at that point, it's like, do I really go back to school? Am I, am I, am I really going to take on a loan to, to – and, and no doubt, like I think what the baby boomers probably failed to do was keep up with the times as well of mm -hmm. times of change because like you know if you stay someplace for 30 years that means you're the science to stay in this hive for the rest of your life pretty much and you're not really exposing yourself to to other businesses other companies and nowadays it's kind of looked upon as if you don't have another a number of, of companies in your resume people are scratching their heads like why how come you haven't been so cultured already right with your with your career you know um they don't mind a little salt and pepper on your resume. Well, before, if you had one resume for, you know, one uh, one job on your resume for thirty years, they were like, "Oh my God, that's that's amazing." And now it's like, "Well, you're kind of yeah. limited in your skill set." Right, right. Right. So they got. I think they kind of got bamboozled, like saying, "Hey, do this," and then, "Hey, we're gonna change the finish line for you midstream." Yeah, it, it, we should. We as as people, we should be constantly evolving in different capacities in our lives, different areas of our lives, whether it's spiritual, um, our knowledge, professionally, relationships, whatever it is, we should be constantly evolving. That's how we've been created, to evolve, to evolve, to evolve. And so if, again, back to the baby boomers, if they're spending 30, 40 years in their career in one job or one type of business, a type of profession, they're not evolving, then they're going to be faced with that kind of stuff. So one thing I, I, I tell folks, you know, and as we're talking to maybe any Baby Boomers listeners now or folks in my generation, you have to be 
evolving because there's going to come a time maybe in the next 12 to 15 years that my generation professionals and career, they're going to be in the same position. And right. so if you're not evolving now, I'm talking to your audience now, if you're not evolving now yourself, getting more, um, finding different ways to use social media to build your network, LinkedIn, stuff like that. If you're not evolving now, you're in a, like the baby boomers are today. What do I do? This I built my identity, my, my lifestyle around this career, around my profession, and now it's being taken up from me because of you know the natural course of history. I'm getting older. I need to. They want new new blood in, and so we got to. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that we have to constantly be evolving, and you know, with with the generation in order to stay relevant. Have you found that people either don't know how to network or don't value a network? Both, both. I have I have someone who's very dear and close to me. Don't think he values network, and because he don't value network, he won't know how to work network. Now, then there's people who come to these networking events. I do a lot of those myself, where they see the need to network, but they don't know how to network. Mm. So it's a little bit of both. But for the ones who don't value network, they're twice defeated because they're, you know, at least other ones are trying. And so I think that's a lot of it. Again, we live in a, a relationship economy, you know, and so if we're not constantly like evolving and building relationships, then we're missing out on the, the the mutually beneficial uh, that mutually benefits that can come out of building these relationships. And another guy will say, you know, he talks about it in, in terms of a relationship revenue. I mean, mm. as I'm building a relationship with Johnny, I'm indirectly, you know, building my revenue through working with Johnny. Relationship economy. Absolutely. Yeah. And vice versa. Absolutely for me as well. You know, when I contacted you, it was based off your Instagram page. Um, I found you and I was like, you this guy's amazing. <laughs> oh, thanks, brother. Thanks. And, and I was like, um, I'm gonna have, to, I'm gonna DM him, you know. And when I get my guests, I'm getting my guests from all Instagram, and all for pe- all interesting people I want to speak to and listen to and learn from. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, when I first had my first guest, I was like, well, you know what? I'm gonna have to just be ballsy, and say, you know what? Love your content. I'm gonna give you some kudos. I would love to have you as a guest. They can either say yes or no. And, you know, if they say no, I can't get defeated. I just got to keep on asking, keep on going forward. And as people have said yes, I've actually have made some great relationships without even knowing or wanting to, right? Right. And you'd be surprised how much you can connect a per- with a person. And you don't have to divulge. I think people confuse networking with divulging your deepest, darkest secrets. <laughs> Does that make sense? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I, and I think what people have to understand is that people get mad and say, hey, you have to know someone to get this job. No shit, Sherlock. That's been the story for forever. You know, back when Carnegie and everybody else was coming up with all this stuff back in the, in the industrial age. Yes, that's how everything always worked with networking. Mm-hmm. Right. And for some reason, we just haven't taken on to it and, and value the strength and the power because, man, if you have a strong network, you're very pretty much almost undefeatable. I think what what I see is some of the problems is number one is people is either a, let me say it like this they're looking too much at others and their uh, success or achievements and accomplishments and I think in part they're keeping themselves away from these type of events from networking from building a relationship because they don't feel themselves valuable enough to be in that kind of crowd. Wow, you see okay. what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. I, I know this is true. I've heard this from people. Hey, what can I give? What can I offer? These people are already. And so, th- again, it goes back to confidence. It goes back to self-worth. And so if you can get in your mind's eye that you have something to contribute, irregardless of where those people are at, you have something to contribute and just allow yourself to be in that environment for a period of time, you can – and be be verbal, be vocal about it. You can see like, you know, hey, yes, they're smarter than me. They're more accomplished than me, but I still have something to offer to this group here, especially if that group wants you to be around. And so I think if 
if folks can kind of just get that out their head, well, I just nothing I can give to these people. They're already no, 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 no. You're selling yourself short, and you're missing out on building some profitable, beneficial relationships just because you're selling yourself short. You're talking yourself out of it. No, that's that, that's fantastic right there because I think you're right about that. Where people feel like, hey, my gift isn't good enough. Mm-hmm, right, and that, and that's when that self doubt does come into play, and it's like, well, you can't put, you can't compare things like that, you know. And we always tend to compare things for what's greater, right? Mm-hmm. And when you do that, you psych yourself out, because then you kind of identify at that point you do devalue yourself. Devalue, yeah, yeah. You know, you become that that car driving off the lot, <laughs> right? As soon as you drive it off, <laughs> immediately, right? Immediately, you go down. Yeah. Um. Why do we do that? Uh, I think, I mean, I would say there are several reasons, but one reason that come to mind, Johnny, is because we have not had enough people tell us how good we are. Mm. I can't tell myself I'm good because I haven't heard anyone else tell me I'm good. Right. I must not be good then, or even worse, I'm hearing people telling me that I'm not good. I, I don't have anything to contribute. So I think it's a little bit of both. It, it's no one is a... Is, no one or not enough people are affirming me and affirming my worth. And because I don't get that from others, I don't know how to affirm myself, then I just stay in the background or I just stay out of these influencer circles, even though I might be on the fringe of the circle because I don't feel I have anything to give. So again, to those who are listening to this to this podcast, you know, don't wait on someone. I, I remember hearing someone tell me this years, years ago before I started ministry. I was about to start my church, and my wife and I, my family, was in another church. And you know, I've been thinking about starting my own church and whatnot. And the lady told me I'd never met this lady before, and I'd never seen her again after that. I remember Johnny. It was kind of surreal. I was at the hospital. Real quick story. I was at the hospital with my dad out in Louisiana, and I was uh, it's probably 11 p.m. at night. And I wake up from my nap or whatever it was. And this lady just sitting there with her family. She said, the Lord told me to tell you something. You're waiting on your pastor to, to affirm you, to tell you that it's okay. You don't need to hear that from him. Affirm yourself. God already said you're ready. And so I want to tell that the people who is listening out there, you're waiting on someone to affirm you, to value you, or to put a place of value on you. And all the while, you're probably not going to get that from them or won't get it from them in, this, in the way that you think it should come. Don't worry about that. You don't need that. Be confident in who you are. Be confident in what you're in your own identity. I like to say it like this. There is power in your identity. Be comfortable in your own identity and who you are and what you can contribute to society, to your own sphere of your sphere of, uh, of influence and move in that. And as you take that step to start moving and make that decision to move, what you need to be impactful will start coming to you. But you cannot, but it won't it won't come to you until you first make that decision and start taking that first step. So don't wait for somebody to affirm you who you are. If you think you have something in you that you can change somebody's life, that you can make a difference in someone's life, move forward in that, and you'll see that. Wow, I don't, I never needed anyone to begin to tell me I can do this. I can't do this. Do you ever feel or have people in your congregation that they pray, they pray, they pray, but they're just waiting instead of acting on something. Uh, yes, 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 yes. That's that's um, that's a common theme. That's a common theme, theme and theme amongst um, I will say Christians is that I'm waiting on God. I'm waiting on God, and I'm not. I'm no longer pastoring anymore. Uh, I'm waiting on God. I'm waiting on God, and you know it, it's yeah, it, it's it's common. I think what we have to understand is that. God, and I'll speak in the Christian sense, meaning I'll use the word him and he, you know, God is 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 waiting on you to take action. It's waiting on you to do something. And then when you start moving, then you're going to see God moving. I like to say like this, everything that we are, that we need, everything that you need, Johnny, to be successful, everything that I need to be successful, to be impactful in this world has already been given to us. We have to take the steps now to pull that out of the spiritual dimension or the spiritual realm and bring it down into this physical plane, this physical realm. But it's already out there. You have already been equipped with everything you need 
to succeed, to achieve, succeed, and thrive. You just now need to tap into that. You don't have to go out there. It's not somewhere afar off. You have what you need, so you got to first look within. And so what God is waiting, if you will, wait on God means don't just wait passively. Wait um, actively. Go out and do something. All right. Can you touch on being authentic and people understanding that authenticity is is great <laughs> yeah absolutely if you're going to really uh, this is how i look at it if you're going to really make a impact a lasting sustainable impact on other people's lives you have to be authentic your authenticity is going to resonate with their innermost person and they're going to want to change again i stress lasting and sustainable because you may be able to reach them with some of your inauthentic in inauthenticity in the beginning but after a while because it's not substance it's not going to last with them unless they are able to find substance from someone else, from someone else. And so that's that's what I pride myself on. And I want to talk to marketers and say, okay, that's great, Cornelius, but that's not a good message. But anyways, you know, that's what I pride myself on, that I am authentic in when I'm interacting with people, when I'm talking with people, like, hey, this is who I am, you know what I'm saying? This, this is what you can get from me. And through that, I'm able to connect heart to heart with these individuals, and that's when change can start. Because for a period of time, those individuals are going to be looking at you, Johnny. If you make an authentic connection with them, they're going to be looking at Johnny for a period of time. Think of them as babes, right? right. They're babes, and they're going to need to hold your hand to help for them to take those first two steps. Maybe obviously not uh, literally, but they're going to be looking at you for, okay – I connected with Johnny on this level here. Now I'm going to watch what Johnny is doing, and I'm going to feed off of him until such that I can sustain on my own. Of course, they're not thinking through it like this, but that's exactly what's happening. When we see someone uh, you know, in the limelight, whether it's a pastor or Tony Robbins, or something like that, we're hanging on to his words. We're hanging on to with their actions. I was with uh, Les Brown yesterday bunch of them, about 45 or 50 of us with Les Brown today. This man is obviously is just, you know, Massive voice the past, you know, three or four decades. People who come to know of Les Brown, they're hanging on to his words until they were able to sustain themselves. And so being authentic is truly authentic. It's going to help the individual that you connect with have a, la a lasting, sustainable transformation in their life. Why aren't we so patient to wait? We're so quick to want everything right now but we don't want to do the work for it like, what is that stemming from uh wow that's that's stemming from all the beautiful shiny things we see in you know on television in our neighborhoods social media and not only that when people tell other people of they of their success not all the time but sometimes if not you know half the time whatever when people tell other people of their success they leave out the journey and so if I'm watching somebody on stage and they're talking about how they make it, you know, you know, six figures a month, blah, 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 blah. So I'm hating. I don't do this for me because I used to, but I'm more mature now, you know, but someone who's just kind of started on trying to get that start, trying to get to that lifestyle, right. they're hanging on that. And what they're hearing is the, you know, the lifestyle that the people are living now and maybe how soon they got, they got it, but they're not hearing the journey that it took there. And so that's given us false or given people rather, there's given people false hope that they can have it in six months, that they can have it in 12 months, they can have it even in three years. And so that's where the problem is at with, with us not wanting to, where people not wanting to wait, not wanting to endure the process is that we're seeing so many other people who say, hey, I'm successful. Look at me. I started my business in the beginning of 20, 2018 and now I'm already at a million dollars. It's now 20, January, February 20, 2019. Oh, I want that. I want that. I want to be able to do that. And these people, so we're doing a disservice. I'm going to say I don't do that. Those type of people are doing a disservice to those who are trying to have their own success in life because they're not sharing you know, the the journey that they went through. And I understand it from a business side. They're trying to get people to get into their programs. They try to get right. people to buy their books. I understand that. 
But if you're really going to I, – I heard Les Brown say this last night where we were out, out in, uh, near L.A. He said – um, you know, this is not the thinking today, but he said this last night. He says, you know, many – my paraphrase here. He said many people are trying to do this. You know, they want to go sell from the stage, and they want to sell their products and stuff like that. He says that what he grew up under was the making impact and changing lives. He says that's what's going to sell. He said he, uh, he, said he had a $450,000 hour and a half speaking engagement. He didn't get it from selling from the stage. He didn't get it from selling his books from the back. He got it from making a change and impacting people's lives. And so if we really want to make a difference in people's lives, we need to give them our story and 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 believe that they're going to resonate with our story, and from that is going to uh, 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 you know, compel them to want to buy into our programs, want to buy our books. But again, that's not how it is. It's we got to sell. We got to market because even those same successful people are looking at people who are more successful than them, and they want that quick fix as well. And they know one of the ways to do that is to sell hype, to sell uh, you know, the, the, the glorious lifestyle because that's what sells. Sexy sells. Sexy sells. You're Sexy right. sells. Sexy does sell. <laughs> um, but it, you, you're selling it through an empty vessel. Yes, right. An empty vessel that is in dire need and unfortunately is going to find out probably weeks if not months later that this was not the right thing for them to do or this is not going to work for them. But again, it's it's just the, it's the economy we live in. Yeah, because that's where people are grasping at the bit just to – achieve but these are empty achievements right they, they they're right. trying they're trying to fulfill something that they, they still don't know over themselves what they want to do with life mm-hmm. and they're chasing the bag and because that's all you hear get the bag get the bag but no one talks about like you said the journey or the process it would take to get the money mm-hmm. right and a lot of times what you have to do honestly what i've learned is you have to give things up for free absolutely yep, yep. you have Start. to Yep. Sure. You have to serve, sure. right? Yep. Um, give things up for free, and people may think of that as a as a shocker, but no. Like honestly, I learned that from a drug dealer. Mm-hmm. He would they would give you the coke or crack for free to try it out because mm-hmm. they knew you, you were going to come back. Right. You know. And, and so what that, what that tells me is that then people are not sold on their product, whatever that product is. Right. Their tra- their transformational coaching their six step system they're not sold on it and that's what that's a good analogy you use it's a good analogy yeah because at this point in time it's like you have like you said earlier you have to find yourself you know it comes down to all the things you've been touching with the authenticity the confidence the self-worth the value of yourself to then from there release yourself from yourself because i think we we tend to hold on to this idea of what we're supposed to be instead of just being who we are there's power in our identity, and if we can be comfortable with that, we might not see the power right away, but if we can just hold on to that, because we're, we've been created uniquely, and there's a, a unique set of um, talents, gifts uh, that you have, that I have, and that's been given not for our own benefit, but to go out and help others and help others to discover their own uniqueness and talents and skills. So if we can just hold on to that and just believe that, you know what, there's power in my identity, in my uniqueness, and my uniqueness is going to create for me the lifestyle that I want and not someone else's. So that's, again, that's where we get lost at. We want to, and I've been there. I know I can speak because I've been there. You know, you you want to, you see the other guy out there doing great and having success and you want to take on his identity only to find out maybe a year later, six months later that now this is not working with me either because that's not your identity. There's power in your identity. And if you learn how to tap into that, develop it, package it and serve it then it'll get you the lifestyle that you that you want and the success that you want. When did you come to your crossroads, your crosshairs, and discovered who you really wanted to be? Um, seeing other people succeed and trying to be like them and not succeeding. It's like, okay, something is wrong. What? Why? I'm doing what they're doing, at least at some level. I'm doing what they're doing. Uh, and so I think for me, that was one of the things that changed. It's like, you know what? Dude, just, just be yourself. 
you know, just be yourself. And another aspect that that changed to me really was understanding the power of the mind. I, I will say that was number one for me. Okay. The very, you know, really understanding this, who we are as spiritual beings, not Johnny the label, not Cornelius the label, not Johnny the body, not Cornelius this body, but the spiritual person, understanding who we are and the power this spiritual entity that we that is housed in this body has. Man, when you can tap into that and start learning that, your your life will start to change. It will give even the most with with some consistent reading and studying and embracing this, it can change the most downtrodden person in the project into something successful and mighty. Do you think people go to to church or to whatever religion they're in trying to find that, but it may not be the right, I guess, congregation for them? I mean, I think that could be happening. I, personally, I think people go to church because everybody said they need to go to church. Right. <laughs> I mean, true. really. Yeah, I get I get cursed out all the time in Atlanta. Atlanta's huge. You know, we're in Bible Belt, oh, yeah. so oh, they'll yes. hold up that Bible and curse you out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this this world we live in is 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 just you know obviously there's some genuine authentic people out there who's doing evangelism mission work. I'm not talking about you know third world. I'm just talking about in your own city, whatever. But especially being in Atlanta area, knowing you know the mega churches out there, you know it's it's, it's a business man. So yeah, I, I think if you know I think if all the churches burned down, <laughs> somebody's gonna call me on this here. If all the churches burn down, a fair amount of those churches burn down, over half those people won't even go back to church. Well, yeah, I think I think that's not a bold statement at all. I think that's that's very accurate. I think yeah. I think that you're, I think like you said, people just go to to go to 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 say, hey, if 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 there is a God, I'm good. <laughs> right. Right, right. And that that's what because they're, they're not practicing anything really, right? It's really just a select few who do. And with that being said, his spirituality really, really hit because this is not the first person to that I've spoken to so far that has touched on that, mm. and how big it, it, it people really getting trying to tune with themselves and understand that we just can't exist anymore. Mm, right. Yeah. It's we're missing out, and, and uh, unfortunately, you know, I'll I'll put myself in that category when I was ministering for eight years. Well, I'm somewhat in that category. We're not teaching enough of the spiritual person. Uh, we're teaching, obviously we, they teach because I don't do this anymore. Right. Um, pulpits teach from the spirit aspect of what's seen in the Bible of the Holy Spirit. Yes, the Holy Spirit's in you, but they're not teaching and empowering, let's use a better word, they're not empowering um, the, the, the masses, those in the pew, the people in the pews on how to be, how to create their own, you know, the Holy Spirit, God is all something external, uh, the way most teachers teach it from the pulpit. And so I think that's where many would be successful, or could be successful Christians missing out because they're listening to, you know, what's being taught from the pulpit. And that in itself, it's its own limiting, um, restrictive messaging, um, yeah, been there. I did it, and so I know. <laughs> I know. What made you stop? Um, well, I will say first and foremost, it was the coming to know myself as a spiritual person, and to be more specific, the mind. When I started studying the mind, that started conflicting with my what I would teach from the Bible. And so I knew eventually I would have to stop. And so what, what's actually closed the church down for us was us leaving, leaving Gwinnett County and coming here to San Diego County. So that's what actually closed the church. But it was, it was all a matter of time. It was all a matter of time. And so for me, I had, you know, I just couldn't go from Sunday to Sunday teaching things from the scripture where I had now an, a, an evolved um, understanding of God as divine, God the higher source, not necessarily the God of the Bible, uh, mm -hmm. but God, and and also having a deeper understanding of the mind. And so I couldn't go back and tell people, you know, God wants you to be broke, or God, you know, you, you know, he, you're blessed when you're poor. Said, no, 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 I just couldn't do that anymore. That's not how I believed anymore. And so it was just becoming, and I had to find creative ways to uh, to talk about um, metaphysics principles from a Christian pulpit. 
And so I was, that was some of the struggle that I was wrestling with from week to week. You know, how do I do this without, without being ridiculed for saying things that are, um, you know, not per se written in the Bible, but still have Bible uh, parallels to it. Yeah, a lot of people who go to church, they, that's where they get a lot of information from. Yeah. You know, so sometimes it's, a lot of times it's their, their only true source, um, whether it's from other parishioners to actual the preacher themselves. Um and that can affect someone's idea or method of movement throughout their life. Absolutely, absolutely, I agree. Like the way I like the way you said it, your method of movement. Sometimes the word evolve, people are like oh evolve, but method of movement is throughout the life. It does because you it's it's it is a it this it is a limiting teaching, okay. And so that itself is the box. And so if you stay in that box. Your whole life, you're only going to learn what that box is. What's written on the walls inside that box, if you get my my, my reference. Absolutely. And, and so, when you restrict yourself to one interpretation of the most highest form of you know entity that we know of, then you restrict your movement, as you said, your movement in life. And we're not talking about moving from you know one place to another or having a new car. Yeah. You're moving right. spiritually. You restrict that because you only know of that. I think it's a great starting point, as it was for me, a great starting point for um, changing your life, transforming your life, especially if you come in from you know some kind of um, questionable background, whether it's drugs, alcohol, robbery adultery, whatever it is, I think it's a good starting point for changing your life. No, I agree. I, 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 when you say that, because growing up in, in Brooklyn in the hood, like, you know, I see people come out from being addicted, addicted to drugs or just come out of jail. And since they already were, had this addictive nature, they went into the church and then they became super, super advocates mm-hmm. of, of the church and like, they became super preacher, right? And they tried to, because that's another form of addiction. They, they couldn't have that drug anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they went ahead and said, I got to go full force with this. And it seemed to me, and even back then I was young, but it seemed to me it never cured the addiction. They just moved from one addiction to the next. Um, and they became super just preachy and, and sometimes even overburdensome with, hey, you're living in, I was really assuming how someone else is living their life based off the book. Right? Yeah. I mean, again, it, it it has. I mean, if, if anyone, for example, let's just take this into the business world. If you work with a coach and that coach helped you, you know, ten extra business, Grant Cardone, ten extra business, you're going to be a, you know, a, a Grant Cardone. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, promoter. You're going to promote his stuff. You're going to talk about yeah, Grant. You, Cardone. And, you, and you're going to be a disciple. I don't think there's nothing wrong with that because you know that that uh, platform, that church, that you know, the Christian uh, beliefs, it changed your life. So, of course, you would be that. But again, I don't think it's meant for us to stay there. And right. that's what I, if I can communicate to any Christians that might be watching, listening to this audio here, listening to this podcast, I don't believe we're meant to stay there. I'm I have a degree and I have an undergrad degree in biblical education. So I spent the money, got the education, pastored for eight years, total to, total ministry time, I think 12 years. I've been through all that, but I know we're not meant to stay there. We're not meant to stay there. And if we choose to stay there for the rest of our life, we miss out on an evolution, or to use your word, of movement that can bring us to a higher consciousness of who we really are. It should be, I think it should be a starting point, right? It, it is. It should I be a, a starting point. Yep. It's a starting point. Now, with that being said as well, are we interpreting that book incorrectly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah, not largely, but I think there's. I think we are interpreting it where it. Uh, okay, I, I'll say it like this. Yes, there are some misinterpretations, but I think the bigger problem is is that we're leaving stuff out. Mm. That's the bigger problem, because if you put things in there, the uh, the Gospel of Thomas. And some other books that maybe the, the uh, that wasn't canonized are not in the Christian Bible. If you put those things in there, then it opens up a different mindset. Uh, it, it yeah, it opens up a different understanding to 
who we are as people, as spiritual people. So yes, there are some, a fair amount of them, misinterpretation, misinterpretation and misuse going on of scripture. But I don't think that's where the problem is at. I okay. think the problem is that we have left things out. Because if you bring things in, then that will that will uh, not cancel out or negate the interpretation, but that will make the interpretation irrelevant. You see what I'm saying, Johnny? Right. It will make it irrelevant because you have a deeper understanding of who you are as a spiritual person to where if you hear something that is uh, wrongly interpreted, then it won't phase you because you know who you are as a spiritual person. And so that's why I say it's not the it's not the interpretation or the misinterpretations that is wrong. It's what's being left out that's hurting the Christian church. Do you feel sp- spirituality has been characterized to where it's almost like a cartoon figure? You see uh, <laughs> someone doing yoga on a mat type of thing or you know they're, they're, they're humming with their fingers and their legs crossed finger, no, fingers touching how do you think it's been characterized to a point in a negative way uh, I, I think it has I almost use the word negative to it uh, okay. but I definitely think it's been what it does is it waters down the value of it right it waters down because I don't know this so I can't speak to the touching of the fingers and the stance and whatnot. But yeah, right. I'm, sure if, I'm sure if you talk to someone who is a trained yoga person and not just someone teaching yoga or someone just doing it because they saw you know a YouTube video of it, mm-hmm. but I'm, I'm sure if you speak to someone who is trained in that art, like Tai Chi, Tai right. Chi is never was meant to be a, a defensive movement or a, a, it was it's, it's a way of aligning your chakras, aligning your breathing, getting one with God, one with nature. And so if you talk to someone who really understands the history of that, you will see like, wow, yes, this is why they hold their fingers. It may channel. I don't know. I'm just saying it may channel something through the, the, uh, the, the, the chakras, the seven or eight chakras that we have that line up in our body. But because we don't speak about that or those who do yoga, that's because it's not commercialized. Right. We see it as just, okay, this is just another. But no, I think it's it's just the way it's been presented and packaged over the decades that that um, lessens its impact or – yeah, it lessens its impact and – uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Benefits that it can have on people. Now, I don't sit down personally and do that, uh, not because I don't want it to, because it, just, it doesn't appeal to me. Uh, mm-hmm. But you know, but I do my my meditation and visualization and stuff like that. But because you know, it's been watered down. It's now commercialized. Like you see, you see pictures on people's website and postcards and stuff like that. Yeah, we're not going to take it as what it is. But I know. I believe without a doubt that it has a deeper meaning that can really change people's lives if we just have if we just took the time to go understand why it is. You can take anything. Why do they do that? Now I see. Hmm, I'm going to start doing it. And I think that comes into the realm of self-care, right? Yes, yes. That's a, that's definitely part of self-care, like, you know, what we do is we get up to an alarm clock. We tend to rush to bathe and to get ready and to calm, groom ourselves, to run into a vehicle, to stick, stay in traffic for over an hour, to get to work, to stay in a, in a cubicle or I have to call it a hamster cage for over eight, nine, ten hours, right? And then by the time we come out, we don't get to see the sun because we leave so damn early. And then we come out, the sun is already going down. And now we're trying to make it back home to spend time with the family, get the kids ready, and then do the whole routine over again. And that has to come to a stop. Like I, I, I have young children that get up at five o'clock in the morning and go to school, to be on a bus by six forty-five. Mm-hmm. That makes no no sense to me, right? Because that's messing up something internally with them. Absolutely, yeah, it is. Well, that's not going to change for any of us, for any family, any household, any individual, until I believe, until we're able to truly connect with God, God for us. Find, discover our purpose, know our purpose, okay? Connecting with God, knowing your purpose, le- using your purpose to um, help other, help others and, uh, for lack of a better word, profit from it, okay? Notice the order. Profit is at the right. very end, this very end. When we can, when we get in line with those elements of who we are in, in our society and inwardly, then 
we can get out of the hamster cage. We can get out of the rat race. And I've heard so many stories where people, hey, you know, I just, you know, I've, I've found my purpose and I just started pursuing my passion. And now I'm living my life like, you know, I'm, I'm not. So that I think that's what it was going to require. So any of those who are listening to us talking here, listening to this podcast, and you're in that rat race, you're stuck in traffic in Atlanta. You're <laughs> stuck in traffic and whatnot. It's like, how am I going to get out of this here? Well, I would challenge you to first, as best you can, connect with you know, divine, connect with God. It doesn't mean go to a church. Um, find your purpose. Figure out how to use that purpose to help others. And the natural course of that, the way the universe works, you will get back. It will give back to you. Translate it, your profit. And so if mm-hmm. we can put these elements in place, we can get ourselves out of that rat race and, and put ourselves into, into uh, we'll call it alignment or balance. Both, really both, alignment and balance. Right. And it's funny because this whole time we've been discussing and talking, not once have you spoke about money. Would, yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's – I, I mean, I have to remind myself from time to time, money is a byproduct mm-hmm. of who we are and what we do with who we are. Mm. And the greats of Dr. Wayne Dyer and some of these other philosophers, you know, they'll tell us, you know, we should not be concerned about money. We live in an abundant, an abundant universe. And there's plenty of us if we can understand it. So we need to take our focus so much off of money, yes, and put it on how we can use this. Because again, if we can operate in the context of our purpose, our passion, to serve others, then a natural byproduct would be profit. Yeah. And so that's where, and again, the first thing is connect with God, because the vine is going to show you your purpose. Your divine is going to guide you how to use your purpose. Divine is going to is going to help you um, bring the necessary resources and people and contacts and uh, knowledge into your uh, to your path into your knowing so that you can serve others so you cannot leave out that connection of being connected to the divine because it is your higher self within you that's going that is connected to what what I call the super conscious the super conscious um, that's going to give you that that okay this is what you need to do now you know what we might call your intuition or what it's really called is called your intuition your intuition is that voice that is connected to the superconscious and that is going to guide you to where you need to go uh, and so that's that's how we and that's what i've been doing it's like trying to live my life according to those principles you know divine purpose serve profit that's yeah. that's how i feel and we're going to get what we want in life. And when I say what we want in life is balance and, you know, fulfillment and whatnot. I think so, too. What you are seeing, saying all this, this is fantastic, that people shouldn't get confused either saying that you should do all this and live poorly. Right. Like if if you, if you have a goal and you like if you like certain things, like if you want to buy a house, buy a house. If you want to buy a certain car, you can still do that. The, the main thing is just know that you did it. It wasn't. It wasn't because you were trying to match somebody else or, or live up to the Joneses. It was because that you achieved some inner peace mm-hmm. and you just so happened to have the funds to get it. Right. You know, because um, I want people to understand, like, you don't have to go to dire extremes. People think either you got to be super strict and be a monk. <laughs> or, you know, and that's how people think a lot of times. And it's a shame that they think that way because they hear, well, now you're saying – you know, you're saying, I got to be spiritual, do all this. And they can, they assume that means, hey, there's a, like I said, because they, they've characterized being spiritual as being not abundant with wealth. Right. Which is it's actually, false. right, <laughs> it's false, right? If anything, that's the most abundance of wealth you can actually have. Um, and and not, not really giving value to the green piece of denim paper. <laughs> That we've deemed to be so valuable, right? Yeah. So again, that's what I say. Another thing that's left out is that, in that case, is both misinterpreted and left out. Right. Uh, and and it just keeps our people. And I don't mean that in a color in brown, black, and anything. It just keeps people in a um a, a limited state. It's yeah. Anyways, anyways. 
No, yeah. this is this has been fantastic, man. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I just enjoy talking about this stuff here and looking forward to uh, hearing hearing the uh, you know the broadcast. Absolutely, absolutely. This has been amazing, um, Cornelius Simon. You can find them. Let people know where they can find you at. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So again, my name is Cornelia Simon. I'm a um, uh, personal development coach, achievement coach. I uh, do a lot with uh, corporate professionals, helping them break through to the next level so they can achieve massive success. I really, I really focus a lot on achievement and, and confidence because I think that's um, that's what we, we're, we, we need, our folks need. So you can find me, go out to my, I'll start first with my Instagram page. Go out to Instagram, uh, it's Cornelius Speaks is my username. You can find me there. Also my website, CorneliusSimon.com. Um, and if you want to, um, you know, if you need a boost in your confidence, definitely uh, I have a free coaching session where you can go to my website. It's boostmyconfidencenow.com, boostmyconfidencenow.com, and you can register for a free 30-minute coaching session, coaching session with me where um, – we're going to get right to it and hmm. we're going to get your confidence up because, you know, it's it's something, again, as we said earlier, it's an inner strength. It's an inner working and, uh, you know, I can help you get there. So, yeah, CorneliaSimon.com, Instagram, Cornelia Speaks as well as you can find me on, on Facebook. And I'll put all these links in the show notes as well so people have reference to that and they can awesome. click on it as well. So be fantastic. Um, we have to do this again. Oh, man. Yes. Awesome. Yes. <laughs> we definitely do. Um, I could do this. I could talk about this all day. <laughs> <laughs> You're super amazing, super motivating. Thanks, Johnny. Thank um, I guess I've been following you for a while, and and it, I just I couldn't. I was so happy that you decided to 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 grace me with your presence on this podcast and agree to come on because i i'm i'm always humbled when people say yes they want to come on and be a guest and that's why i always say giant on my presents because this is not my podcast this is me presenting real people uh for real people right and what i mean by that this is this is a platform for the people this is not my podcast this is yours you know so as we end this giant nomad presents Cornelius Simon. Thanks again, man.